You're listening to Mark of the Maker. And this is episode six. Hi, you're listening to Mark of the Maker, and I'm Mark Steiner. This is episode six, where we're going to talk about uh, Mr. William Skagel and uh, his influences on basically everything that we know about knives today. And um, I'm going to dish this over. Well, actually, I probably should make sure that everybody's here. So, Tom, you're online, right? I'm here. And excited. Yes, sir. Michael Birch, you're here as well? I am here. All right. And Mr. Sean Kendrick, you're with us as well? Present and enthusiastic. Oh, enthusiastic. As always. Oh, yeah. All right. So Tom is going to start out by just kind of explaining, you know, for folks that aren't familiar with Skagel, you're probably asking yourself, who who is this guy and why are we talking about him? So Tom's going to give us a little bit of explanation on why, uh, why he thinks it's important. I guess why we all think it's important. So fire away, Tom. Thanks. So, uh, yeah, why Skagel? What made us unanimously choose William Wallace Skagel as our first knife maker to take a look at? Uh, it's my opinion that there are several reasons. First and foremost is because he was a knife maker's knife maker. He didn't believe in anything other than his best effort or the best materials. Uh, second, his work and designs have been some of the most influential in American history and we'll go into that in detail a little later in this episode. Number three, uh, it's my opinion that he was a true Renaissance man. And I think as we go along in this, you'll see some of the skills that he had in so many different fields. And lastly, he was a bit of an eccentric character. And uh, I think he would fit in right along with the rest of us knife makers at Blade, uh, even though he was a bit of a hermit and didn't tend to like being around a lot of people, I think he would fit in with the, most of us. I think it's important to remember that uh, while we are enthusiasts, we're not experts on William Skagel. Um, and also, there's not a lot of information. There's a few books and articles, and some of it is a little bit controversial and uh, contradicts each other. But uh, yeah, William Skagel, he's a knife maker's knife maker. So I think one of the primary sources for information about Skagel is uh, Dr. James Lucy. And so in the odd event, the Dr. Lucy ever listens to the podcast, which certainly would be possible. Um, we apologize in advance. <laughs> right? And, <laughs> Cause and like we said, appreciate all the effort he put into the book. His book is pretty awesome. Absolutely. Very much. And I didn't even know his middle name was Wallace. I assumed it was Wales. Did I say Wallace? You did say Wallace. And I was like, I can see how that could <laughs> oh, possibly It work. is Wales. Okay. I was like. <laughs> it is Wales. All right. William Wales. Yeah. Sorry. You went You went Braveheart on us. William Wallace. I did. I, I wasn't what? looking at my notes. I was just talking. It is Wales. William Wales Skagel. Stroke of the microphone, Tom. Rewrote mm -hmm. history. Sorry. <laughs> We've already come across so many that probably that will not be my first mistake, yeah. I'm sure. Well, and like like we've uh, talked about in prep for the episode here, there's a lot of conflicting information too, right? So yeah, we're going to tell people what we think we know based on a couple of different versions of his story, and um, but in the end, I think the history piece is interesting to people who like history. But the point is to try to help lay a little groundwork about why. And I, as we get through the episode, I think it'll become very clear on why he's important and people should understand a little bit more about his work and what he did and kind of some serious um, road or ground that he laid for the rest of the knife makers that are around today. Right. Yep. Uh, yeah. Very much. All right. So I think Michael is going to dive into some kind of basic history just to tell people who, uh, who Bill Skagel was and a little bit about his life. Well, to begin with, you know, if you've never heard of Skagel, you know, get on the Google machine and 
pull up some images, you know, check them out before you kind of get into this podcast. So you have an idea of, I guess, what we're talking about. And you'll probably recognize his style if you've been around knives for any amount of time. And you'll be like, oh, okay, that's okay. That's who that is. That's who made these. And this is why I've seen them so many times. But like Tom said, you know, be bear with us on this. You know, there's a lot of anecdotal type of stories. We don't know really what's true, what's not. You know, this was a long time ago. He was supposedly born either 1873 or 1875. We're not quite sure about that one. Um, in Sarnia, Ontario. But um, as we were talking about earlier, supposedly he his mother was went down to Michigan to help somebody. He was born in Michigan and but then taken back up to uh, Canada. So he's Canadian, but never really claimed to be Canadian. So just another one of those type of stories we don't quite know about. And then he he got married, you know, around 1889, um, his the first time. He uh, he had a couple wives. Um, they didn't quite work out for him, though. Um, and that kind of became a part of who he was later on in life. And he started working in 1895 for the Western Railroad. And uh, supposedly, you know, they talk about his first knife kind of stuff was 1896 because he worked as a blacksmith at this railroad. So when they talk about him being 23 and, you know, starting his knife career in 1896, we can assume he kind of pounded out some of the knives when he started working at the Western Railroad there. And he worked there until about 1913. Um but he also joined the Merchant Marines in 1905, and he went around and basically traveled the world, saw a lot of places, and did a lot of things, and came back. Um, and he ended up living in Durand, which is, Mark, you tell us a little bit about Durand. So Durand, Michigan is just outside of Flint, Michigan, and um, Flint is sort of, uh, not central to the state of Michigan, but in sort of the, if from a north-south perspective, the lower peninsula of Michigan, it's about a third of the way up through the state. Okay. And Durand was a, was basically a, a significant railroad town. And so there was a, a major railroad company there called the Grand Trunk Railroad, which uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, later I when the- I could not hear Grand Funk. Yeah, exactly. Well, that's what I was just going to say. When I lived in Flint, when I was going to college, uh, the railroad overpass or the railroad uh, bridges that would go over the road in the city of Flint said Grand Trunk, and people would graffiti them and change them to say Grand Funk. Nice. Because of the band. <laughs> so kind of a weird little twist. But Tom yeah, may... Duran, oh, go ahead. Duran's outside of Flint. Tom may know this. So when did he officially move from, from Sarnia? Into Durand, you know, I couldn't find any information on when that was. Um, it was shortly after he was married. I think uh, his sister was giving him a little bit of a little bit of a problem with his new wife, and I think he just packed up and moved, uh, never to go back. It, we come to find out that he wasn't really a fan of of women or people in general. I think which played a big part of how he ended up living and doing stuff like that. You know, we find out he'd like dogs a lot more than he liked people. And there's, you know, I can, I can agree with him on that. In some parts of it says in, uh, the Skagel handmade book, he moved to the United States in 1900 at the age of 25, 1925. At that point he was in, he came to Wisconsin, right, Tom? What's that? I think he went to Wisconsin in 1900, right? That's when he finished his British Maritime Marine Service or whatever and uh, came to the States in 1900 to the lumber camp in Wisconsin. Yeah, I think so. I think in 1915, he moved to Durand. He also, in 1905, he lived in Indiana and he married, that's where he married Alice Green. That's a very short period of time. From 1980, 1889 to 1905, that was the the first marriage and then the second one? The first marriage didn't last very long. 
Uh, she she took off with another dude, I think. While he was working at the railroad. Yeah, he he got divorced in 1902. Mm. From his first marriage. I wonder if that played a part in him going into the Merchant Marines in 1905. So here here's a here's a first mistake um, that I that I'm seeing. We said he married Rosetta Moore's at 1889, and it was actually 1898. 1890. Oh, well, that would make more sense in a timeline. Yeah, that works better on yeah. the timeline. That was a question I had, but it, I was looking at the other book. Like I said, the books don't necessarily line up a hundred percent. Yeah, it's it's very disjointed, but. But, I mean, really, the dates aren't that important. I mean, they are, you know, and then he moved, basically, he left Iran, supposedly, around 1920 and moved to, how did you pronounce it earlier, Tom? <laughs> Muskegon. Muskegon. <laughs> <laughs> That's right, Michigan isn't people it? Pronounce it <laughs> yeah. Michigan people pronounce it Muskegon, but uh, I appreciate your creativity. So, right? William Wallace, he moved to Muskegon. You know, <laughs> it's like we're writing some knife making fan fiction. Uh, but he, he basically had his shop burned down around what, 1935? Right. But supposedly he set up a, a shanty right next to it and was like at work the next day. Like hey, he, he, threw just, a, he threw up a tent and a, a sheet metal building or something, right? Yeah. And we're, we'll, we'll come to find out this guy was, he could make and do about anything that he set his mind to, you know, he just, he wanted to make stuff. He was not a guy that gave up easily. That's seems clear. Ah, uh, I don't think so. Yeah. You know, he's basically like the revenant, you know, the revenant, you know, that fellow that, uh, that belt wrote that true story about of knife making. He just, he kept going, doing what he wanted to do, but you know, then it got things got real important around the nineteen thirty seven when he bought a little spot in Fruitport, um, called the Dogwood Nub, little piece of land. Yeah, one acre. One acre. And he built his own property there. And this is becomes real important because this is when Bo Randall enters the picture. Um you want to tell the story of Bo Randall and the knife? Uh, so basically, you know, Bo Randall, uh, their family had a, a lodge up on a lake near Fruitport. Uh, I don't think it was very far away. I think less than 10 miles. And uh, he witnessed one of his neighbors scraping the bottom of a boat. And it, he was doing it with probably the finest knife that Bo Randall had ever seen. And uh, it, it disturbed Bo Randall that he was using such a nice knife for such a kind of coarse use. And Bo ended up buying the knife, ended up tracking down William Skagel and, uh, started corresponding with him. And actually it went to Fruitport and, uh, learned how to make knives. Um, and to this day, um, if you go to the Randall, uh, factory they have or showroom they have uh one of the best skagel collections in the world and that first knife is uh right center in the collection uh, over the years he had kept adding to them and uh harry mcavoy who wrote the second book on the actually the first book on skagel uh talks about in there that he would go and buy them for him and and Bo, and they were only two to ten dollars at the time which is pretty crazy. Yeah. Yeah. And and that's and that's where this really starts to become very important because it, you've heard us talk about it before how important the Randall knives are to probably all of us. Um and how important they were to to knives and the fact that you know the story of how Loveless started because of Randall there's this kind of lineage, you know, it's like a tree oh, yeah. that starts, you know, basically the trunk we're we're at the trunk and it just branches out. Um, and, and that's kind of the crux of why I think we find him very important to, to knife making, not just because of the knives he made, but because of what he sort of started. Yeah. The influence. And that's, that's not to say that there weren't fantastic knives. And that's, you know, that's one thing I'd, I'd like to ask you guys about, you know, one thing we see about him quite a bit is, you know, he's the father of 
custom knives. And I see this written many different ways. And I wonder what the first phrase, how it was actually written. You know, the father of custom knives, the father of the 20th century custom knives. You know, we've seen it written many ways. Yeah. But at the same time, you know, in the 1850s and whatnot, there was these fantastic knives being made, you know, like your Michael Price, your Will and Fink, your, your San Francisco, you know, style knives were being made. But yet I think what made Skagel stand out was not only the knives, but the lineage, how it grew from there to oh, where yeah. we are now. Well, and, and Dr. Lucy in his introduction, he says, you know, uh, why is he so important? Because he gave art form to the American knife for the first time since the passing of the Bowie age 50 years ago. And if you look at his knives and there, and he has, he made so many different kinds of knives. It's kind of crazy. But at the same time, how, how can you, how can you not say that a Michael Price knife isn't art? You know, those oh, were yeah. pure beauty, you know, and when he wrote, in 1937 is very important because that's also when Skagel wrote Randall and said, I've made 200 some odd knives. No two are the same. And obviously I'm, I'm paraphrasing heavily here. Yeah. Um, you know, many were made with ivory and such and, and maybe kind of sold himself a bit on what he's made and stuff like that. Um, but at the same time, you know, these knives, these same, those knives that like, he was talking about were being made on the West Coast. You know, these were art knives. The fit and finish of the Michael Price stuff was kind of head and shoulders above, you know, what we were doing. But, you know, the the flip side is, you know, as we'll find, Skagel didn't use – he was not using the same equipment those guys were either. Yeah. You know. Right. You know, you guys want to talk about – Tom, you want to talk about how his shop was set up and, you know, what he was using? Well, it's pretty interesting. I mean, if you – there's not any real pictures of his shop. I mean, it's just descriptions. And, uh, you know, Bill Skagel was first and foremost, he was, he was a Smith, you know, he, he wasn't just skilled at, at knife making. He was skilled at wrought iron, uh, his, his property in Fruitport, the dogwood nub. Uh, there's, there's a fence around it. And if you look at the fence, it's got some of the most intricate, you know, metal work on this fence. It's like, how did he find time to do all this stuff? But, uh, yeah, his shop was really pretty basic on, from what I understand, you know, his, he forged a shape and then he had wooden wheels that he made that he coated with abrasives. And that's how he finished his knives. You know, uh, it's, it's, <clears throat> I saw some other things that, uh, you know, basically, uh, he was, he was almost like, a uh, a creative genius as far as mechanical genius he would he created a lot of tools that dr lucy said he could have patented harry mcavoy talks about it you know and that that goes back into his past too you know his mother's brother was uh you know the lee and lee enfield so another mechanical genius in the family yeah he was obviously very skilled at at just making about anything you know from and I think he built his shop there. He built um, – was, it wasn't like a meditation, but what was the other shop he built on that, that property? The one that had the piece of paper oh, in where it? Where he kept the paintings and – Yeah. And that goes back to what Tom was saying about sort of a renaissance man. He was – it was about art, I think, in any sort of form, be it in – Craftsmanship. Yeah. yeah very. He was fond of seascapes from what I read. Yeah. Well, it's, he, it's, he, was a great, he was a great boat builder. He built a metal boat and sailed it across Lake Michigan and back with a dog. And his father was a boat builder, yep. right? And that's how he probably learned some of that. Supposedly he had some land down in Texas somewhere. And he, at the time of his death for, I don't know, quite a while, he'd been building this gigantic wooden houseboat. And his dream was to put it on Lake Michigan and sail to Texas and then live on his property in it with his houseboat. But wow. uh, that never happened. But yeah, just crazy stuff. I mean, his copper work, amazing. And he built, he built the buildings that he worked in. He built his house, his bungalow. He made the leaded windows. You know, he had a some kind of a stairway that went to the second floor that was like counterbalanced. They talk about, so he could pull it down and up. Uh, 
Yeah, it's kind of it's kind of crazy. He made a lot of his own tools, and you know, in my mind, I I I don't think his shop was all that fancy. You know, no. Uh, interesting thing on how yeah. he powered it. So I guess he had a bit of a interaction with the electric company at some time, and so he had basically cut off all electricity. So this dude was off the grid, and he had submarine batteries from World War One. That were in a bunker. Trains going by. <laughs> um, but yeah, so he he had a windmill and he had a a little you know single cylinder engine that he he bought that would charge the batteries and that was all the electricity he had. And in his knife shop, he had he had somehow acquired a 1926 Cadillac and he pulled the motor out of that and that's what he ran his whole shop on. You know, uh, overhead shaft with pulleys coming off of it. So yeah, that's that's one of the things that I wish we had was it, pictures of his shop. For me as a knife maker, I, I think that that would be super interesting. Yeah, supposedly like and, we're saying, he took yeah. the the motor out and left the rest rusting away, and he didn't even have a driver's license. Yeah, he he didn't have a driver's license. So. You know, he moved there in 1937, so this would have been, you know, 10 years old car or so. And uh, he just acquired it, pulled the motor out, and let the rest rust away. Well, and and it's probably a good time to maybe introduce how Dr. Lucy and him got to know each other. So I can't remember the date. Let me look um, just to make sure. Um, I think it was 52, I don't know, somewhere, yeah, 1956, uh, Dr. Lucy was called out to the shop and he'd seen this guy and, you know, he, he was a fairly new doctor in, in the area. Um, and he had noticed this person walking around, uh, kind of an eccentric gentleman, didn't drive anywhere cause he didn't have a driver's license, walked everywhere. And, uh, even in the summertime, he'd be wearing his coat and hat. Uh, but, uh, basically he got called out to the shop and I guess he had injured his wrist and it doesn't really mention what happened other than later on. It talks about how Dr. Lucy said he shouldn't be working so hard with all the stitches. So I don't know, somehow he got mangled up and had to go in for treatment and Dr. Lucy ended up following up. And that's, that's where that first connection was met, made. And uh, Dr. Lucy uh, started kind of getting interested in his work, and, and pretty soon they became friends. Although there was still stuff in his past that Dr. Lucy couldn't ask him about, especially women, any of that stuff. Uh, basically, he would just shut down and Dr. Lucy would leave. Well, supposedly he didn't even – he didn't even know about the knives. You know, he talks about it regrets not watching some of the processes from the beginning – I think he was right. intrigued with him as a person. I guess he didn't smile much. Um, he yeah. was, like you said, he walked around in a coat and a hat. Didn't say much, didn't smile much. You know, supposedly he had a pair of binoculars at his shop. And if you pulled up to that gate that you were talking about and he didn't like you, he just yeah. waited until you he left. He wouldn't come down. It's yeah. the It's the ultimate level of hermetism that I hope to achieve someday. You know, right. it's... <laughs> <laughs> dream that dream man yeah it was just him and his dogs man well and, and i i talked to kevin devitt today yeah um and for those of you who don't know he's he's a collector you know a friend he's a, a really good guy yep and he's he's collected a lot of different knives and he's owned two skagels uh currently owns one now um and i and i just had to ask because i've never personally got to hold one you know, what drew him to the Skagel, you know, and he, you can tell he's got such a, a love about it. I think that the idea of how Skagel was, you know, we talked about how true it was to, to kind of do art out in the middle of nowhere with no outside distractions to just have one focus to make knives and not be worried about what other people are saying about it how they're talking about your process or anything like that and just making your art how you want to make it. And I think there's something kind of beautiful about that. And I think that's kind of what drew 
him to it. And I think the history, the person, all that kind of bottled up is bottled up is kind of what drew him to it. And he said just the feel of it too. It's one of those knives that has, you know, I hate to sound kind of hokey, but sort of a soul to it, sort of a a feel. He says very similar to a Moran sort of knife. You know, just kind of has an anima. A, yeah, has a weight to it. Um uh, you know, and not in a, a heavy weight, but a you know, a soulful weight, I guess. So it's just interesting. Well, and, it, and and what's interesting to me is he didn't just make knives. I mean, that's that's his main thing, but he did he did, you know, volunteer work for the local doctors for, you know, when they like he made somewhere out there there's polio braces with the Skagel Chris on them. You know, cuz Dr. Lucy said he marked them. You know, he made a bunch of tools, you know, and marked all his tools. Supposedly he marked all the tools in his shop. You know, how cool would it be to have a hammer with the Skagel mark on it in your shop? It, oh yeah, or something a pair of tongs. Yeah, yeah it's it's a base. Where'd all that stuff go? It's somewhere out there, probably at a you know who knows. And all the like you know we talked about earlier. There's so many things that he made that he didn't stamp because it, once that goes back to that rigid standard of this is a knife that people have to use and I stand behind it. You know, if he didn't, he he got talked into making a knife out of like there's a story about him. You know, these guys bring in steel, you know, to him and be like, hey, you know, soldiers bring him steel. And he, he wanted to help. He made him a knife, but he would not stamp his Chris signature on it because he didn't know the steel and wouldn't put his name on it. Yeah. Harry, Harry McAvoy says he brought him a piece of steel to make into a throwing knife. and He wouldn't stamp his his uh, Chris logo on it because he didn't know what the steel was, you know, exactly. You know, he, he really liked that silver steel. So this is a good spot where to probably explain the mark. And and I think it's this, in addition to explaining what uh, Skagel's mark looked like, and for people that might not know what, when you say it, it stamped his Chris on it, what that means. But, you know, this kind of really goes to the core of the show and why the name of the show is Mark of the Maker, right? Mark of the Maker isn't Mark Steiner. It's not about me. This is about makers placing their mark on a piece of their work uh, as the ultimate statement of their, I don't know, pretty much of, yeah, of their of being, quality. really, I right? Mean, this is, it's your standard. If it doesn't meet your standard, you don't put your mark on it. If it's not a heavy mark, if it's not, it doesn't have some gravitas behind right. it, then, you know, it, it shouldn't be there. It, it needs to have weight behind it. Yes. And so in this case, that is exactly what we're talking about, where Bill Skagel wouldn't mark the knife if he didn't know where the material came from. Not not because, you know, he, he didn't personally source them. Well, I guess it is because he didn't personally source the material. But he, like you said at the beginning, he really wanted to know everything about it. And he wanted to have uh, his ultimate um, confidence in the product when it was done, right? Before he would put Which his I, mark I on. I find kind of interesting now because you know this. He's one of the, he's a he's a bladesmith, one of the early bladesmiths, and he didn't use leaf springs or any kind of salvage crap. He bought steel that he knew what it was and he knew how it was going to react, and that's what he used. Period. Which I find super interesting. Yeah, for so many folks that have followed that have said, yeah. "Oh, we can use you know whatever we find salvageable type of steel." No, he wanted a known quantity and known entity you know for what he was making because yeah. he knew that's what he could stand behind when he what's interesting is he also had a, a friend at one of the factories that they talk about and he would have his knives rockwell tested from time to time and they were hard they were 60 to 62 rc which is pretty hard for a, a yeah you know for a blade it's simple carbon heck yeah so so his mark one of his his main mark, if you see it, it's like a Malay Chris, and it's interesting because Bo Randall also uses a Malay Chris, but his is like curved the other way. Um, so when you say Malay Chris, for people who don't know what that means, that means a dagger, basically, with a sinuous a sinuous S shaped blade, like a snake shaped blade, right? A wiggly shaped blade, and it would also say. So he had several different stamps, and I was trying to find those. You know, it would either say USA made or Skagel made. And it was, there was certain stamps that he would use for certain things. Like 
Um, if he was marking Amber Comrie and Fitch, it would have different marks than if it had, you know, it would have their name, but he also wouldn't, I can't remember if you, one of those, he wouldn't use a Chris on or, or the made in USA or something, but there was, there was a way that they were all marked very specifically. I think in one of the Lucy articles, it talks about how most everything was marked USA and the pieces that were branded for like, and that's probably worth explaining, right? When we say Abercrombie and, and Fitch, we're not talking about the- This isn't where you go the, by Schmedium shirt uh, <laughs> their kids. It, it actually is the same but company. Yeah, right. We're not talking, but yeah. It's, but it's changed. This is- this was, this was where if you're going on an expedition to the South Pole, you'd go and buy your gear. Or it was a real deal outfitter. Yeah, going on a hunting trip up into Canada or whatever. He built knives basically under contract, right? To Abercrombie and what was the other one? V V and A, I think, or something like that. V and A. Uh and he got angry with them because during the depression they sent him a letter asking if they could mark his prices down to help him sell, and he basically said, Send them all back and I'll never sell you anything ever again. Uh, so he 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 had a bit of a temper. I think if you worked the Abercrombie uh, knife uh, booth, you know you'd be setting pretty good right now if you'd bought some of the stuff, you know because he sold right. to them, you know then Randall sold to them and then Loveless started making because he wasn't able to get a Randall from Abercrombie and Fitch. You know it's just it's interesting yeah. how it all kind of goes back around to that synchronous. Mm hmm. Well, and, yeah, but yeah, those are the marks: the the Skagel, the Malay Chris, and uh, some of the other marks uh, that he did. Um, really cool. I stuff. I wonder how he came across that. You know, I wonder as was that a Merchant Marine type of uh, something yeah, that came across, or I mean, just an interesting type of, I guess you know, something to use. I know you can use anything and everything, but just interesting that he chose that. I think his I think his main personal mark, like you said, aside from the the Chris mark, there's a mark that actually says Skagel handmade. Yep. And I, I think that's where the title of the book comes from, right? The main yeah. book that we're kind of referencing in this or And he he also would sign some and, and he signed a lot of like his letters and stuff with a a W Skagel with an arrow underneath of it. Like he would etch those on some of the blades. And some would be two Chris's and Supposedly, you know, I talked to a dealer that that bought and sold a lot of them, and he said very rarely would they be in the same place. Huh? You know, he would move them all over the place. Yeah. Well, and if you look at the pictures, you can see that. Well, probably put it where it was most advantageous to market. Probably just whatever he was feeling that day. Yeah. So, just to give people kind of a lay of the land where all this is, um the different places we're talking about for people that aren't familiar with Michigan, the Michigan, uh, <laughs> the, the Michigan people's guide to the state of Michigan is the convenient map. That is your right hand. So, uh, the state of Michigan looks like a mitten. And so if you take your right hand and put it out in front of you and turn your palm toward yourself, <laughs> your thumb is on the right hand side. I'm totally doing and that. We, believe it or not, we actually, we actually call that part of Michigan, the thumb of Michigan. Um, down at, at the first knuckle below your uh, thumbnail of your right thumb is where Sarnia, Ontario is because Michigan touches Canada right there. And so Sarnia is where his family lived. His father had a boat building business and other stuff. Um, and so Michigan is connected land-wise to Canada between that first knuckle and the second knuckle of your right thumb. So that's kind of where he started out or where he was born and where his family lived. And when he came to Michigan – he came basically directly across to the opposite side and just a little bit north on uh, the place that we were talking about earlier. Muskegon, Michigan uh, is a big harbor area that is on the west side of the state uh, out on Lake Michigan, right on the shores of Lake Michigan. And Muskegon was a really had a huge boom right before the turn of the century. So in the late 1800s, uh, the last 40 years of the 1800s. Uh, was a huge logging area. And so all of Michigan was being logged heavily. And Muskegon was one of the places where the boats would come in um, and haul logs out of there and lumber and everything else. So 
Oh, that's just to kind of give you a little bit of a picture. And then when Skagel built his shop in Fruitport, Michigan, Fruitport is just southeast of Muskegon, just out into the country a little bit. So it really is almost like a, I'll call it a, uh, on the outskirts of Muskegon is probably the safest way to say it. And so, um, one of the things that, uh, Bill Skagel used was some material, some handle material stuff that came from Brunswick. And so people that are familiar with bowling stuff or, um, or Brunswick is involved in lots of different things, but, um, they built a factory in Muskegon. Brunswick did a 100,000 square foot factory in Muskegon in 1906. And that was all about billiard tables, billiard balls, making pool cues and chalk and stuff like that. And, um, the boats would come in, um, and bring maple in from way up in the upper peninsula or in the, uh, up near Lake Superior boats would come in with maple, um, and other materials, uh, and serve that factory that was there in Muskegon. And so Bill Skagel had friends and connections at Brunswick and that's where some of the special handle materials come from. And this is something we didn't talk about earlier, but here's kind of an interesting, uh, an interesting note that Brunswick factory, uh, was the world's largest user of hardwood. Wow. That's kind of wild, isn't it? Yeah. They, they manufactured over 400,000 pool cues a year. And, uh, they had these big, huge drying kilns there. Uh, for all this maple that was, you know, so you've heard the term before, right? Michigan maple. Um, that's what they're referring to is these maple that came out of the northern or the upper peninsula of Michigan. And the drying kilns alone held enough maple to build 600,000 pool cues. What? Wow. So, yeah, major deal. And they consumed a huge, massive amount of hardwood and a whole bunch of other materials. So, if you guys want to talk a little bit about what some of the other special materials were that Skagel used, um, this is a good spot to well, do supposedly it. Supposedly, he had a spot. I think it was in Canada where he said he got. You know, you, you look at a lot of his knives. He would use some stag, or the end of it would be a piece of stag, a yeah. lot of stack type of stuff. He supposedly had a, a where a, a killing field or a, a dying spot where he would find this. Well, I thought it was where they stag. would shed their yeah. antlers every year or something. Yeah, it was. It was. He called it something special. You know, who knows? You know where it actually was or. If he didn't just go down to the five and dime and find, you know, something, who knows? But supposedly it was a Secret special spot. place where he would go every. But truthfully, you know, he he probably did. You know, it, it sounds like something eccentric and something he probably enjoyed going and doing. Part of his, you know, way of doing supposedly stuff. Supposedly he'd go up there every three or four years and get enough to last him until the next time. Also interesting, he was a, he was a pretty good hunter, supposedly. Uh, he also was a shot competitively a little bit it sounds like but uh every year so kind of crazy he was a vegetarian but his dogs weren't so every year he'd shoot a couple deer and they would hang out back and he'd cut part pieces of them off for the dogs <laughs> i didn't know that yeah he he had a he had a pretty eccentric diet too he ate like flapjacks and something else i mean there was like only like four or five things he ate. It was, it's kind of crazy. Huh. So he, he used a bunch of different materials, right? Like he was, he had, he used ivory, which right. obviously he didn't get locally, right? That had to come out of Brunswick or somewhere. Um, and then Sean, you mentioned something earlier about the fiber. Like these are stacked handle knives. Man. The vulcanized fiber. Yeah. So that's one of the materials that was in these stacked Correct. layers on the handles. Mm-hmm. Oh, and that's where a lot of the color in his handles came from. And he used now, a lot of do you guys, okay. leather. Yeah, because you see like brown and red. And, do you guys think... Yeah, which now it bears mentioning that his handle style was as much a hallmark to his knives as his logo was. Right. I mean, they were... He did them all fairly similar. Well, I mean, different shapes. But the stack process and the general look very linear from knife to knife. Yeah. Well, yes and no. I mean, I, I agree with you. His his knives had a look, but he also did a bunch of uh, like full tang knives uh, with wood or elk or ivory or whatever. Uh, 
But yeah, the washers are kind of what he's most known for. The leather washers with the vulcanized fiber and the antler caps. Yeah. Now, do you guys think he set out to make that? Or you think that was a, was because of those are the materials that he got? I mean, how do you think that came about? You know, as, you know, people, you know, guys that design knives, you know, what came first, the materials or the idea for the knife? I'm guessing the materials or the access to the materials. Yeah. Yeah, but to incorporate them into the process the way he did, I think is where Michael's going. Well, I'm interested to know if he made that stack type of stuff before he moved, before he got those materials, or if he was like, okay, these are materials I'm getting from Brunswick, you know, my friend in Brunswick, this is what I can do with it, you know, because, you know, it sounds like, you know, from what we've read and learned and and know, he was a very kind of calculated kind of man. He had a system for whatever he did. And however he did it, as as, as eccentric as it may be, there was a system for it, you know. So it makes you wonder how he came about some of those designs. It was what, you know, how yeah, was it because that's what he had laid out in front of him. For sure. And I think, you know, so I remember talking to Dr. Lucy and when he died, Dr. Lucy ended up getting a bunch of the tools and and some of the the materials. He he had the materials that, that were still in the shop and he had spacers that were already cut out. So... You know, Skagel would cut these spacers out and keep them separated and stacked and, you know, ready to go. Yeah. And we've heard stories about, you know, what did I read in one of the articles that they talk about meeting him and saying, you know, his shop was dirty, but he was never had a sense of being dirty. You know, he was naturally dirty because of blacksmithing and the way he lived. You know, he lived in the loft above the shop, you know without any really visible, you know, sanitary type stuff, but he was always had a clean presence, a neat presence about him. Yeah. Which is interesting for, for a man who lived as sort of a, a, not sort of a very hermit lifestyle on his own, that he was very, I think, fastidious about how things were done. And I think that's part of his knife making process too, that things were done in order the right way, how they should be done. And I think you can probably see some of that in some of the modern knife makers now and how things are put together in a certain way that in, you know, our heads is the right way, good or bad. Yeah. So I think there's a lot of parallels between, you know, his his way of doing things and some of the, you know, a lot of makers out there. And maybe that's why we all kind of like him. That we, he's he's the the far outreaching version of what we are sometimes he's a guy that took it you know that started doing it and did it to the extreme you know he was willing to take the thing as far as it needs taken all the way and and lived it and did it and he this dude was such a craftsman and had such an eye if you look at his designs i mean they have such a line you know and and he was he liked he liked embellishing them a little bit too. I mean, with the spacers and the leather and, you know, he would, he would take mercury dimes and pound them out into these arrowheads and pin them to the handles and stuff. You know, I mean, he, it wasn't just function, you know, he, he, he was putting a little bit of himself out there and putting some art into his knives. There, yeah. There's most definitely an art to it. There's, there's no doubt about it on that. And, and it's still relevant today. I mean, you're talking 60, 70 years or more later. These knives look like they could be at blade. And what's crazy is you start thinking about it. He was grinding these on a on a, a wooden wheel. Very primitive Pretty interesting. machinery. The way he made them. I mean, you know, we all kind of credit Moran for the apple seed edge. Uh-uh. It was Skagel. Yeah. His knives, when you got one... It didn't look like it'd been sharpened because it was a apple seed zero edge. I mean, it was literally that convex edge to zero. Um, that's what they were known for, and they they held up like nothing else. And it, you know, we credit that to Moran, but Moran's fifty, sixty years later. I mean, still mm-hmm. a great craftsman on his own, but yeah. but you know, that Moran edge didn't start with Bill Moran. It probably didn't start with Skagel either, but. You know, it was on his knives. Tom, when you say apple seed edge, what does that mean? So if you look at, if you pull an apple seed out and you look at it, you know how, you know, it's kind of comes to a point at the bottom. 
Yep. So it's convex. Instead of being hollow ground, it's convex. So it just comes down to a, a point. And so it has that shape. If you cut a blade, you know, if you cut the front part off at the, from the back part and you looked at that cross section, it would, the bottom would be that apple seed edge. Right. Okay. A very strong edge. When you find the pictures, very when you robust. find the pictures online, folks are going to see that, right? Just like you said, there is no secondary bevel right. where the edge is sharpened. It's like all the way down to the cutting edge from the from the main shape. Well, and as a knife maker, I, I'll be honest, I look at his knives and I feel like a total failure sometimes because I've got this shop out here. Uh, you know, I've got a pneumatic grinder that's running a variable speed and I've got all these different belts and everything. I don't know if I could finish a knife like that. It's like, Holy smokes. It's like, how does he do this? And that's kind of the mystery to me is like, you you start thinking back in time on what these guys had to work with and the tools they had. And it's like, man, that's pretty impressive. And these were selling for what? 15, 25 bucks a piece at the time, you know, 50 so I think bucks. His, his pairing knife started at a dollar 50. And I think I a Bowie, a camp knife, was twenty five dollars when he's early in the early point. Yeah, it's pretty crazy, you know. It, and some of them are very, you know, kind of primitive looking. I guess rustic looking. You know, some people may, you know, have Googled it earlier and, and be like, I don't, I don't see what you're doing. I don't, I don't see it. I guess. But like, look at the axe. You know that the camp axe he he made. You know, there's, it's not just one piece of you know, flat steel with a grind on it and a flat handle. It's a forged, balanced piece of, of art. You know, it's, you got to look at it with the eyes of, of how you would make it at that time with very little equipment. And it gets to be very, very impressive. Well, and I think one of the things I thought was really interesting reading through Dr. Lucy's reference material was – Skagel was this super prolific guy, right? He made a zillion knives, whether it was, you know, a fancy carving set for some people down the street or for some explorer or for a soldier or whatever. He did tons of different kinds of knives. But um, one of the things that Dr. Lucy talks about is how it's sort of the ultimate custom knife, right? Hey, uh, Skagel, I want you to build me a knife. And here's what I'm going to do with it. And it wasn't like, oh, here's my pattern. Pick the handle materials you want. <laughs> it, I, it, right? This yeah. is like, no. okay, tell me what you're going to do. And then I'll make a knife that will do what you want. Right? And th so that's why there's a, a, all these different shapes and, you know, literally no two are the same. I mean, I guess that's probably true. For as prolific as he was, it seems hard to believe, but... Yeah, I mean, you know, it's pretty I mean, I think amazing. That's one of the things at the core. That. I don't. For as long as he's been making, he really. I don't think you can say he really was that prolific. I, as far as the amount of knives he made compared to like Loveless and stuff, I, I, I guess as a comparison, you know, he he made for a long time up to I don't know how old he was, ninety or something. Yeah, over it, fifty. It was, he had a career that lasted over fifty years. Just, and, it's just a crazy amount, but. I think he took as as long as he wanted to do stuff, you know, and he might get to it when he wanted to, and he might not. You know, a lot of parallels of that to, you know, a lot of makers too, my, myself included on that one. Mm -hmm. Well, but, it's pretty crazy when you start thinking about all he did plus knife making. You know, he built this shop. He built this home. You know, later on he built this bungalow, which, you know, he did the leaded glass windows. He did everything in it, you know. He built his own uh, damn gold tooth after he built the pliers to pull the tooth out to replace not it with the a gold tooth. tooth. Yeah, all of them. He pulled all of his teeth, but to to make the gold tooth <laughs> and the dentures later on to yeah. it's just he made everything, you know. And and on on your point about you know that cabin that he built, you know, there's a story in in one of Doctor Lucy's. Like we said, we referenced Doctor Lucy a lot here. Um, you think it'd be all right if I read the letter that was shoved in the corner of it? Oh yeah, that's or cool. Or someone else want to that read they that? They found they found it up in the sack or in a leather sack. Yeah. Yep. So so anyway, the story he he built this you know little log cabin with all his you know oil paintings and it was like 
like in like Sean said, his seascape scenes and all that stuff. Okay, so then it, to be clear, when when Michael says little log cabin, he's not joking. Yeah, eight by twelve. The, at least the one piece, eight by twelve feet. Yeah, eight like a 12. room, basically a small, small room. Yeah, so you know, and this this property got bought, and I guess like in the nineteen seventies, uh, someone had bought it, and they were going through it, and in the like in the corner of of it, in a I think they were sack, fixing the roof. Something that so they found this little little sack. Yeah. Yeah, there was a leak in the roof. There's a letter in it that says, <laughs> says, to the dumbbells that pulled this building down, I built this shack and I did all my own iron work. No one else worked on it. I am 74 years old and was born in the lumbering town of, and this is, there's a mouse that chewed on it and chewed the hole through this, near the village of blank, another spot where the mouse had chewed something, February 12th, 1875, and I am still going strong, another mouse hole. And do my own ornamental iron work. I did the work on Dr. Durham's new home at Lake Harbor. Also the stair rails and the banister inside without any help. But conditions were so, are so rotten in the country caused by rotten politics, unionism, and graft. If you're not one of the gang of criminals, you have a tough time getting material to do business. I have worked, done mechanical work for 55 years, and never saw conditions as bad as they are today caused by... Our rotten government this last 16 years, but we are due for a change this November 2nd, 1948, and I think a change for the better. William Skagel. Okay, so just think about yeah. that. He, <laughs> he tucked this away in this little cabin in case somebody found it, just in case someone decided to tear down his long after his death. And not only was he talking about his age and how much he he built, he wanted to poke at the politics, too. <laughs> Just in case somebody found that letter. Well, it's, That's, it's crazy. You know, we think a 74 today is, you know, 74 is the new 50 or whatever, right? 70s. Uh, back – this this was back in the 60s. 74 was getting up in age for a lot of people, you know? I'm I'm going to start eating pancakes every day. Right? I'm not dropping the meat. Yeah. You don't already? <laughs> but it's, it's just, it's crazy. And, and there's that story of, you know, he was very opinionated about politics, you know, and he made the knife for the politician. You know, he, he made it. The guy <laughs> the asked Democrat. for it. Yeah, but he, no, he no. made it. No, he didn't. He didn't ask for it. So I that story that... is, he, he was walking home from the bar and it was super cold. And the guy he made it for came up and offered him a ride, and he tried to turn him down, and the guy wouldn't take no. Uh, and he was – Skagel was one of these guys that was never beholden to anyone. So he made him this miniature knife, and it had mother of pearl on one side and ivory on the other. Two-sided. And he gave it – yeah, because he was a two-faced bastard. Yeah. It's just such an eccentric <laughs> – Seriously. It's crazy, right? Yeah. But so intriguing. It, it, it just lends to the legend. You know, oh, there's so much intrigue there's, behind this guy. Yeah, I mean, and like the string knife, you know, there's a, the story behind that. Basically, he bought all of his packages at the grocery store, right? And back then, they would they would weigh it out and package it up, and she, the lady would tie it with strings. And she would reach up in the ball and, and just break it with her hands. And she had these calluses all over her hands, and then her hands were torn up. And so a couple of days later... Skagel comes in and gives her this little miniature knife and it there's pictures of it out there. Um and it was her string knife and and uh she you know, he just gave it to her. And the leather sheath had a little pin on it where she could pin it to her shirt and uh cut the string instead of having to break it. Huh. That's crazy. I mean I don't know. It, You're a classy move at that. Yeah. Right? Yeah, when I go to the grocery store, I'm not I I'm not once thought I'm going to make somebody a knife here. I would like to know, you know what's interesting to me? How do you think he came up with the folders in the handle of a fixed blade? You know, does it go back yeah, to I don't, I don't What's the purpose of that? I, I think and I can see it being one of those can I not should I sort of moments. You know what I mean? But I don't know if he would ever do a can I. It seems like like we talked what well, Mark was talking about earlier, very purpose driven knives. Something had a purpose, and in his well, in his head, I bet it had a purpose. You know, it may have been a camp a camp knife. He thought you know you could chop, you could whittle, 
one knife or who knows. Well, one of the interesting things is I guess he was super conscious of, of time that he put into knives. And one of his letters to Bo Randall was all about these knives. And it says, uh, they're the hardest I have to make. They take from 30 to 34, 35 hours for me to finish from forging to the finished article. Try one. So he just kind of <laughs> threw it out there. Yeah. Why don't you try one? See, see, see how, what kind of skill you got. Nice. Yeah. But yeah, 30, 35 hours, he'd forge it from forging to finishing. I mean, that's not bad. And now they're worth like 20, 20 some thousand dollars. Yeah. And, and that, that once again, that kind of surrounds the mystery, you know, shrouding this fellow. You know, if you're not aware of the cost, you can't just go on eBay and grab a Skagel for a hundred bucks. Well, there's, he made 12 of them there and there's pictures of all of them. And I think there's six or seven that are known to exist. And there's another, you know, what, five of them out there somewhere. Are you talking about the, the, so the, if you find one, the, let me know. The fixed folding knives. Yeah. He made those for yeah, there's, Abercrombie and Fitch, correct? Yeah. And there, and there, there's five of them out there. And that's a, that's what's so crazy about Skagel and, you know, in a, in today's time where we have the internet and cell phone and all these ways to communicate around the world easily and, and ship our stuff around the world easily, uh, you know, we take it for granted. But back then, you know, like, like Mark said, he, he supplied knives for the Smithsonian ex, uh, <clears throat> expeditions. <laughs> he sent, he sent knives, uh, swords to Mexico for bullfighting. You know, if you're going on a, a big hunt somewhere, you're going to get a Skagel knife and take it, you know? It's just it's such an interesting history, you know, and, and I wonder how much we don't even know about. Because, you know, there's what we do know is just a little bit. And I and I kind of wonder about, you know, the pricing of his knives. You know, like I, I mentioned there, you're not getting one for a hundred bucks. You know, they're thousands upon thousands of dollars to buy a Skagel knife. Um, upwards of, I don't even know what the most expensive one probably has been, but there you could spend 40000 easily on a, you know, high quality Skagel knife. There's two pretty cool daggers on eBay right now for... Ten thousand and eleven thousand, I think. Cheap, grab them. Yeah, right. <laughs> well, and that's I put them in my cart. And one thing I wonder, you know, how how important do you guys think Doctor Lucy is to the equation of Skagel, to the popularity of him? I think. Well, yeah, I think he came way late in life, though. For you know, I think his stuff, his Skagel stuff, was already pretty well known at that time. Um, and I think, I mean, you talk to the the guy uh, today that said his prices even in the 80s were going up pretty high, right? Yeah, and, and I, I'm in very intrigued by when they went from this $50 table price or whatnot to this skyrocketed sort of price range. You know, and I contacted a few people, and you know, and it says you know, you know the knives and knife maker book, the the book that is worth ten thousand dollars now. It says, you know, that you're welcome. Yeah. That, you know, you can buy a Skagel for $300. And that was, you know, that was made in what? Uh, 71. 71. Okay. So then I talked to another fellow that was saying, you know, a dealer that said that they were started hitting the 10,000 range, you know, late 70s, early 80s. So what happened? Where, where did that go? You know, obviously, you know, he did something very almost unthinkable you know he he created such a base and scattered his knives so far for a man that barely left his house it is yeah. is amazing how did he do that was it abercrombie There's, was were they so i mean so abundant that i don't know that so so even even before dr lucy i think they were starting to be pretty well valued because uh he has a set. There's a set in uh, the book called the Buddy Thompson set, and it's six Skagel knives. Um, you know, all with like a six to eight inch blade. It looks like six, yeah, somewhere in there. 
There's two with the crown stag and the stacked leather, and there's two with the fork stag and stacked leather, and then there's two full tang knives, and they're in this really cool leather case marked Abercrombie and Fitch. And basically, uh, somebody showed up to the door and said, "Hey, uh, at, at his house," and or no, it was a, he was having some computer problems or something. The computer technician saw that he was into the Skagel knives, and then he got a knock on the door a few weeks later, and this family, you know, uh, had a one of their their family members passed away, and they had these knives, and they were trying to figure out what to do with them, and uh, they found out he had this thing for Skagel knives, and he basically told them, "Hey, I can't afford them. You know, they're they're worth way more than than what I could pay." And they just basically wanted him to document them and sold them to him very cheaply, it says, so he could share them and document them. Which well, is sort of this. But it doesn't doesn't put a date for that. It's such an odd sort of, you wonder if it's like the first type of high secondary sort of situation. You know, what fed that beast and right. how did it get there? Was it the fact that they were purpose-driven using type of knives that were still pretty looking knives is that is that all it took it was there you know like we talked about before just a feel to them that was such that was so great that you know because we've all picked up knives before that we're just like holy shit that just feels right that feels good you know is that is that what he had that it yeah. spread so far you know and like we talked about the west coast knives they were very ornate very gorgeous knives were being made over there this was you know yeah the san francisco the san, knives. Yeah, the san francisco or sorry san francisco era knives these were these were knives that were made to kind of replace the the gun this was the, your vest buoy this was your you know the city's popping up metropolitan type of areas you needed a fancy knife to go with your yeah the game yeah to go with stuff. your well-dressed man you needed a well-dressed knife yep you know so i wonder if these became popular because they worked so well and also look good I, you know it's just stuff i wonder about you know, what drove it to that point? So I can, I can tell you they feel very good in the hand. I, when I work for A.G. Russell, uh, you know, they have the, the cutting edge where they do second, you know, sales of, of custom knives and stuff that's uh, – and a lot of people send stuff in. And over the years that I worked there, um, I got to handle probably five or six different Skagel knives, uh, one of which is the dagger with the screaming chicken or eagle or whatever on it. Um and they they all balance very well. Uh, I we even had one of the the fixed blades with the folding blade come through. Wow! Uh, really, really cool stuff. You know, uh, I wish I would have spent more time with him. We also had, I think, four or five of his folders come through, and uh, Paul Paul Bosch was working there at the same time, and knew I was super into this stuff, and he would give me a call and be like, "Hey." come on up and he'd set up stuff in the office for me to look at and uh, really cool. I wish I would have taken more pictures and, and documented it a little better, but uh, I have a few tracings of them with some measurements and stuff. It's, you know how they talk about, you know, your, your kids grow up so fast and you know, you need to get a hug now. I want to start treating blade show like yeah. that a little bit more. You know, if I'm away from my table, I'm out looking for a knife that I need to go touch or feel that, I should have been doing years before. Yeah, that was the beauty of, of, you know, when Dr. Lucy used to come to the show, you know, he was so knowledgeable and so free with his knowledge. He would, you know, and he had an awesome collection. You know, he sold a bunch of it at auction recently, but uh, he had some amazing pieces. He had a bunch of the axes and or the, the small hand axes and some really nice, you know, everything from camp camp knives to the the hunters and the miniatures and he he would let you handle it if he knew you and even if he didn't i mean he didn't know me that great we'd talk every year but uh and i called him once or twice but uh he would he would let me you know take them out of the case and handle them and it's really it's, cool it's, you know it seems obvious that, that was his his passion you know was those knives you know it's kind of like you want to you want to tell everybody about it when you're you're that you know, he had the biggest collection. He had, you know, up till and what was the auction? Two thousand ten. Uh, yeah, ten. Yeah, I think which, so. Which is crazy. You know, he he had this such a huge collection, probably the biggest collection, most interesting collection of all these 
not just knives, but tools and like you Tom saying the copper and stuff like that. And then I mean it was when that went across the internet, it was a pretty big deal. You know, that that he was doing the big auction for him. Well, the New York Times did an article on it. Yeah. I mean, they pulling down twenty thousand dollars a knife, you know. I mean it's that's news. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's pretty crazy. And the fact that it, they're they're still being sold for that amount of money. Usually, you know, you see something get dumped into it. You know, it it's it kind of hurts it. It doesn't seem like it changed too much. Yeah, there there's way more demand than the, the knives, you know. So I think in the kind of to wrap up the story about him, at least him personally, right? Uh, he died in 1963, right? I think that's what's in my notes. Um, and in, according to the the stuff from Doctor Lucy, I mean. He said he died as a pauper, basically, right? I mean, he didn't have any money, so the he did. He certainly wasn't getting rich off making knives, right? I mean, it sounds like he made the living he wanted to make, doing what he wanted to do the way he wanted to do it, which uh, on its own is seems incredibly right. rewarding, right? Yeah. <laughs> Something we, we all should aspire to do, um, but. Uh, you know, people shouldn't look at this. It's a little bit like when someone sees one of you guys' knives flip on the secondary and says, oh, you know, you guys are raking it in. And, well, it's not money that, that you right. got, right? Th that's what it might have resold for. And in these ca in this case, these certainly, while he was alive, weren't carrying that kind of value, no. right? I mean, I sir, I assume he stole, sold stuff later on in his life well, it said in the book, it said that his, his pairing knives would sell for about a dollar fifty, and his larger camp knives were selling for about $25 during his lifetime. So, you know, most of his stuff is going to be somewhere in the middle there. Yeah. And, you know, I, I mean, they talk about how much he, how much money he had at the end. I don't know. I mean, there's a lot of stuff we still don't know. I mean, this cat, he could have been burying stuff in the ground, but, you know, we also know that he had a piece of property in Texas that nobody knows anything about, and he didn't have any heirs. So where did that piece of property go and all that yeah, kind of stuff? He didn't trust banks. You know, when that first shop burned down, he talks about losing yeah. gold and things like that because he didn't trust them. So, yeah, I think that's – I think it's highly yeah. possible that there's all sorts of stuff buried. There's probably a couple cars with extra, you know, engines buried in case he needed another motor. You know, you never know. It's it's such a great a great story, basically. It actually plays to tie. Yeah, it really does, right? Yeah. It would you know, for sure. Well, I think I think it's interesting in winding up, you know, we talk about his death. You know, he he died March twenty sixth, so he was born in February, died in March coming up, uh nineteen sixty three. And it's interesting because the two books that I have contradict each other quite a bit. Um the first book is the Harry McAvoy book, and basically it says they they kind of have the same story going on, but different endings, you know. Uh, basically, Harry says that, you know, his stove broke down and he's super self-reliant, so he was trying to fix it and his hands were cold and arthritic and he couldn't get it back together. And apparently he was, you know, they found him on the ground, it had been four days and uh, he he had about froze to death and hadn't eaten much in those four days because he didn't have any way to cook anything. And Harry says, so this is where the story differs. Harry says that the neighboring family took him in for a year. And then he choked on some fish and died a couple days later. Um, the Dr. Lucy book, which I tend to uh, believe a little bit more because if his his birth cert or his death certificate is there and it's Dr. Lucy that signed it. You know, he's got a photocopy yeah. of it in the book. So I think, you know, Dr. Lucy was actually there and he talks about the the wood the wood stove being broke down and he couldn't you know, he couldn't fix it and this is someone who's super self-reliant like we've talked about and he he didn't want help, you know. He's I I in my mind I see that he knows he's at the end of his life, right? And, uh, the, he wants to go out on his terms. Right. And, uh, basically, uh, Dr. Lucy came and he, uh, found him in this state, knew he was dying. Uh, he had congestive heart failure, uh, diagnosed that at the time 
and took him to the hospital. And I guess a few days later, he did pass away with uh, a heart attack, a, a coronary uh, arrest. And in the book, Dr. Lucy talks about being conflicted about this because, you know, this is a guy that that didn't like hospitals, didn't like doctors. I mean, he pulled his own teeth for crying out loud. And instead of letting him die in his shop where he, he loved to be and on his own terms, Dr. Lucy really felt bad because he knew that he took him to the hospital and put him through this stuff, even though he was still going to die. He knew he was still dying. He was on the way out. And so it's kind of, it's kind of sad, you know, uh, this great man, this great craftsman who wanted to go out on his own terms, it, it kind of sounded like didn't get the chance. But at the same time, I I can understand Dr. Lucy wanting to help your friend. How do you not help your friend? hundred percent. But he, yeah, I mean, that's, that's what we do, you know, in the medical profession, we, we give care whether a lot of times, whether it's good for people or not, that's just what we do. But we have yeah. to keep in mind. Pretty interesting. He was almost ninety two at this point. Yeah. And and arthritis had crippled him up. He wasn't really able to work anymore from what a, both accounts say. Which is for for me as a craftsman is a kind of a terrifying thing. Yeah. You know, I work with my yeah. hands and I have yeah. And if I can't do that, what am I? You know, it's it's weird how our identity gets tied up with uh what we do and who we are. Yeah, and then we go play fast and loose with our hands all day long in the shop. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Sean, were you going to say something before? Well, just Lucy's account of Skagel's death is, it's powerful. When he describes how he found him, I mean, the picture I have in my head, I think I've got a pretty good idea of what was going on. And it, yeah, it, it troubled me a little bit. Yeah, for sure. You know, I think as a, as someone in the medical field, you know, I was an ER nurse for a long time. That kind of stuff, uh, starts where it doesn't affect me the same way as it affects some other people. And, and, uh, yeah, it, it is, you know, my thought is the same as Dr. Lucy's probably let's, let's give care and fix it. And, uh, yeah, basically it was end of life. You know, it's, it's a hard thing to go through. But I have to believe that was a good life. That was a hell of a life. It was well a life well lived. Oh, indeed. Yeah, and and it's fantastic that you know that the, the the to see the prices of his knives to know that they're appreciated. Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. So, Sean, how do you think his designs reflect on modern knife making, modern designs? Man, his designs are still current. You look at the way his the lines flow. You look at how his edges are. You look at how everything comes together. And, I mean, they could be drawn from today, not, you know, over 100 years ago. And he, I mean, he's the archetype for the modern knife maker, basically. He did what we're all striving to do, and he did it way before we were around and probably did it way fucking better than we'll ever do. Yeah, we were talking True. about some of the designs, you know, that we've been, you know, scrolling through and looking at and showing each other. You know, obviously you guys can't see them because you're not here in the podcast with us. But there's a lot of them that are very, look very modern. You know, we looked at one, like as Sean said, was very familiar to a Rod Chappelle type look, you know, and it's just very interesting. And he was doing that without any influence from other makers. It was just what was purely coming out of his head and through his hands. Yeah, off his anvil. Yeah. And I think that's what makes him kind of so pure. You know, the the fact there is no, like we talked about, no outside influence. It's just... Well, then we got to talk about how did he create? Because nobody creates in a vacuum. No. What influenced him? Well, yeah, it, it's very interesting. Where where did they come from? Where did, Like you said, where did these knives come from? And we're visual learners. He had to have seen some knives that influenced him. I would like to know what those knives were. Well, maybe part of that mystery is tied up in his logo. You know, where where did yeah. he go while he was in the Merchant Marine? What what did he see? I mean, that's that's the part that's interesting and that we'll never know, which will drive us crazy, you know? Well, like you were showing us some of the knives, you know, and we're looking at some of the pictures, you know, 
are there any type of ethnic knives that he he borrowed you know features from and there's not a ton that i see you know you see we see the modern knives that we enjoy now you know there's a maybe a touch of barong in some of his stuff but other than that it's i don't see it in there you know what i mean i don't see these different types of of cultural knives no no uh, i see a lot of what what have come to be known as pure american design yeah so did the he just well he, even even like his little hand axes and stuff i mean they're they're so functional i mean i don't know that i've ever seen anything like that before you know that would date before him yeah and then obviously you know what there I mean? were buoy knives before all yeah, this yeah. i mean we, yes there we have that to right. go off of but these are it, it, like I said on one of them, it, it looks like a sog knife. You know, it's a it's a type of fighting knife, sort of, but very kind of it flows. It it doesn't have that that straight pure utilitarian Bowie knife, Bowie knife, however you like to say it, type of cut and stab. There's more to it. They've got stylistic curves. Yeah, very much. No, he understood line and the flow of line and what lines appeal to our eye. I think that all seems to fit with the whole idea that he wasn't – I mean, I, I guess it would – this would be an interesting question for Dr. Lucy would be, you know, did Bill Skagel really consider himself primarily a knife maker or primarily an artist? And you would certainly believe looking at all of the other things that he did from, you know – he didn't just make knives, right? He did all of this crazy blacksmithing work and handrails in a house that he mentioned in his letter that he wrote when he was 74 years old, right? I mean, well, and I think he considered himself an artist, it seems pretty clear, who happened to make knives. And I'm sure that's where a lot of that comes from. Well, and another thing that we haven't mentioned, you know, on his, his one acre there in Fruitport, he also was super into planting all these different trees. So he planted all this stuff that wouldn't grow any, that didn't grow there naturally. And then he grafted all this stuff on all these other trees. I mean, the dude was way out there. Pretty cool. In a good way out there. Yeah. yeah. Out there where we like I mean, to be just sometimes. Well, and I think that's where it's interesting to talk about how the designs look modern when in reality it's, it's oh, the other much. way around, right? I mean, the the fact that the modern designs uh, clearly seem to have come from or these shapes. Been influenced right? for sure. Exactly. Yeah. Well, I read one article where it basically credited him with giving us most of the popular cutlery shapes we use today. Yeah. And whether or not that's true, there is an argument to be made there. Yeah. I mean, there's so much legend surrounding him. It's, it's hard to tell what's fact or fiction. But truthfully, I'd like to believe it is, you know, just because it, it lends to the, the excitement of it. Well, and you look oh, through yeah. the, the book with the pictures and it's like I can see like the bird's head grip design. And it's like, you know, all this stuff is probably before, but it's like he made it his own, man. It's so. Yeah. It's so skagel esque, you know. I mean, when you see these designs, you know those curvy blades and all that goes together, and it's it's a skagel. Oh yeah, it, it, it's it's kind of crazy, you know. I never really thought about where did these original designs come from. Now now I'm, now I'm just it, it, you saying, you know, maybe the, the Chris Dagger. I feel like we're on some sort of uh, adventure, and, and I'd love to know more. I mean, really, the Chris the Chris is a pretty pretty bizarre logo for someone in michigan yeah you know, that had the yeah, you know his travels mean, you know and yeah you know you can see some of the cereals buoy kind of style you know i don't know how that's usually pronounced yeah. you know and that was what an 18 right 20s 40s style buoy yeah i'm thinking 20s to 30s you could see some of that in there but i mean there's just so much that's it's kind of fresh yeah, very unique. I mean, it's certainly not Green River inspired. I mean, no, you know, that's a whole different style, and it's amazing. You know, yeah, I mean, the, the, that was that, probably the most prominent and popular cutlery at the time. You know, yeah, that talk about your your pure utilitarian type of knives. These are your made for those you know, this kind of your mountain man type of knives. 
uh, big upswept skinners and and whatnot. Simple wooden handles. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, simple slab oak handles, full tang. Yeah, real simple knives. Yeah, it's something you might see in a like a butcher shop type of knife. Very thin, very. Uh, I think they use a lot of. Uh, oh, what was it? Uh, Nineteen fifty type of steel. Very kind yeah. of uh, right on the edge of of usable. Super yeah. easy to sharpen. Pretty soft. Yeah, but, yeah, but the idea was that you wanted to be able to sharpen it. Yeah. Well, and I love that Skagel went the other direction. I mean, his knives are hard as hell and, you know, I don't know. It's just they have those lines. I mean, you look at, you look at, I sent, I sent a picture to the other guys and it's a, it's a, a picture with like three daggers and then a dagger-esque knife. And, uh, these are, these are full on combat knives and you can see that they would work, but they're made with natural materials and they've got curves that you wouldn't see on knives of that time period mm-hmm. no especially the one yeah that dagger right in the middle with the fork and you know he did make the fighting knives he did make some of these knives for soldiers you know yeah but he, he did some of these soldiers influence some of the the knife designs or vice versa yeah some really good stuff to think about well, now I'm not going to sleep tonight. Thank you, gentlemen. I'm going to be sitting there wondering about that. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> well, so th- I think that's a, a good conclusion to the topic, right? Yeah, it, I think th- so. There's lots of lots of interesting um, aspects to Bill Skagel's life and a lot of mysterious aspects as well. And... Um, I don't know. Maybe, like you said, you wonder about wh- where did his own influences come from and a bunch of details about his life. But at the same time, that's kind of the the cool, mysterious part about Bill Skagel, right? A hundred percent. Oh, very much. Okay, so this is a great spot to get Sean's word of the day. So, Sean, what you got for us today? Man, I actually thought about this one this week, and the only word that stuck with me was diaspora. Diaspora. And a diaspora is a dispersion of a people from their original homeland. Yeah, I think I've actually read that word before. Nice. I think Skagalicious would have also been acceptable. <laughs> <laughs> Let me check the Funkin' Wagnalls for a definition. <laughs> yeah. Of Skagalicious? <laughs> Good luck. And there's going to be so many people mm-hmm. listening like, what the hell is Funkin' Wagnalls? <laughs> <laughs> You're probably right. So, Sean, what do you got going on in the shop right now? Uh, let's see. I've got a smoke banshee that I've been working on. It's a little different, playing around with the blade shape on that guy. And uh, then a fixed blade or uh, folder. Folder. What's folder. That? Okay. Man, I actually spent most of last week, well, a few days last week, dicking with a fixed blade and I uh, ended up having to bowl the scales off of it because my friggin' clamps marked the micarta and put divots in Ooh. it. And that was a pisser. So back to folders for the time being. Fixed blade pissed you off. You had to change gears. Indeed. And I was working on the fixed blade because no I was getting pissed off at folders. <laughs> so yay me. I was going to say, yeah, if you rewind <laughs> and put this all together, it's kind of a swing of the pendulum. Next week will be fixed blades again. Yeah, right. <laughs> We shall see. Stranger has happened. Michael, what do you got going on? Uh, Actually finishing some pieces up. Kind of doing a thing like I'm pretending to go to a show. So I, get I saw all, a green yeah. canvas Mikado one that looked pretty sexy. Yeah, that was gorgeous. Thanks. Great canvas work on that too, by the way. Yeah, it looked great. Used a new, uh, new wheel. I bought a bunch of different uh, wheels from Rio Grande and just basically trying shit out. You know, I, there's always got to be stuff we're missing out on. So I just figured I'd grab a, a grab bag and do them at different speeds and see what comes out of them. Nice. Uh, which one did you use? I'm on happy. It? Was it the super squishy one you were telling me about? The super squishy one. And I did that at 3600 and I still got to go buy a different buffer to bring that down to 1800 to see what it does. Gotcha. You don't have a variable speed buffer? I don't. I really don't. Uh, you need one. Um, had to go and uh, badly. Oh yeah, no. Uh, well, 
I, I saw one, um, a Baldor uh, dental lathe one that's a two speed, but it's up in St. Louis area. And I just don't want to, you know, travel to go pick that up, but I'm sure it would be cool to get one. Yeah. You, you need very true variable speed. I'm going to, I'm going to be making some, I'll, I'll try to, I've got, a I've got to make buffer? a few. Yeah. Like in my shop, I, I made that one. I'm going to make a few more. So, uh, I've got shafts for, I think six right now. Are they the so, same size as the one I bought from you before, the monster monster size one? Yeah. Nice. No, I like it. No, I, I think I, I I want to start playing with different speeds and stuff because I think we get stuck on that thirty five hundred RPM stuff. Way too and fast. It, it's way, very fast, and it's very cool for fast. getting the eggshell finish. You know, yeah. but you also want a satin finish. So I'm just playing around and seeing what what comes up, and I think. You know, and I'll, I'll put a picture of what that that little wheel was, but it did a very nice finish on Macarta, which cool. It's kind of a mix between yeah, it know, looked great. Kind of a satin finish. I liked it, and that was of course the second set of handles because the other one had too many voids. Good times. Mark, what are you up to? Um, I haven't uh, I haven't done much with the bead thing in a little while, so I actually need to get back on that. I want to do some of that before. Um, before the Florida show gets here and Amy and I were just talking earlier tonight and that's, that's only three weeks away. So wow. um, I, I have some, uh, some beads that John Brown, the Scoopy Loops guy finished. Um, yep. John always does a great job on those things. So I got a few of those. I got to get out there. So maybe I'll try to get those out there this weekend sometime. We'll see. How about you, Tom? Uh, just, just back in the shop working finally. Uh, you know, last week I was out of the shop for about half the week for a basketball tournament again. Uh, my my middle son Ben had a tournament in Nebraska, and my youngest son had a tournament in Texas. So my wife and my youngest son went to Texas, and we went to Nebraska. Um, which I mean, it was good. I got to see my sister, and we had a good time at the tournament. And uh, basically, I took some homework with me. I took my Skagel books, and I took uh, my drawing pad. And uh, I don't know if you guys are watching. I'm doing some uh, kitchen utility knives. And we're working on the full set and I designed, I designed the pairing knives to go with it. So we got three knives and then today I made the, the drill patterns and the handle pattern and I got those all heat treated and, uh, finished up some sexy bulldogs and working on the bushcraft axes. So we've, we've always got 10 million things going in the shop, but, uh, it feels like right now there's more than ever, uh, the Haas is in place uh, we're letting it sit right now so we can try to recoup some funds. It's always good to and, let those uh, things acclimate to your shop, you know, get the the same temperature and, you know. Yeah. My wife's like, when's it start making the money? <laughs> the, you know, when does the money start coming out uh, of it? And I'm like, well, uh, pretty soon, but we still have to stick money into it. So yeah, that, that, that's yeah. the harder part about it. It's not just the, that you're buying a machine that costs a shitload of money. It's all the parts you got to buy and then keep buying because they break or wear out. Well, it's it's sitting back there and we have the electricity ready to go. So far we've spent about 12 to 15,000 dollars I think just getting it there, not not including the machine. Have you named I started it yet? doing I I haven't. I've got a couple things that uh I'm working on and I but I haven't named it yet. Uh, it's, it's really not yours until you give it a good name. I know. I know. Oh, jeez. Uh, but yeah, just doing the math, I think I've still got like twelve thousand dollars to spend before I can actually start having stuff come out the other end, which is terrifying. But <laughs> when it's in your back back part of your shop, yeah, yeah, in the hacienda, I go out there. I go out there and just look at it and like slide the door open and slide the door shut, act like there's parts coming out. And I would like credit for my Hacienda joke. Some kind of credit, some score. <laughs> I'd like to be recognized. Yeah. Oh, boy. Oh, it's man. a Haas for everyone who doesn't know what I'm talking about and doesn't enjoy my horrible pun. Haas mini mill. Mm-hmm. Very good. Very good. Yeah. Good Good week. What are you guys carrying? What do you got in your pocket right now as we chit-chatted about Skagel? And- um, so right now I've got... Uh, I've got, I, I've been carrying, I've been trying to carry some of my own stuff lately and for a couple of reasons. One, 
I like carrying my stuff, but mostly just trying different carry things. And I've got, I've got an advocate, one of my advocates in my, uh, in Kydex clipped in my pocket and it's, it's a pretty good size knife and it carries really well that way. And then I've got a boss 70, uh, flashlight in the other pocket. That's pretty much my go-to right now. I saw you talking about one of those the other day and I was all like, Ooh, that looks, I need, I could use a new flashlight. And the price was like, Holy shit. Yeah, they're, they're high, but it's literally the best light I've ever had. Like, and I've got a bunch of lights, but it's, there's nothing else that even compares to it, in my opinion. Well, it's one of those things you look at and you, you for a second, you're like, oh, that's, then you're like, you forget, oh, yeah, that's what I do too. <laughs> you get kind of brought back to reality. <laughs> the boss lights are the ones that they're almost like a rocket looking shape, right? Where they taper. Yeah, it looks like a bomb. Yeah, kind of looks like a bomb with the end cut off. Nice. But yeah, it's, you know, I, the 70 is an 18, uh, 650 battery. Yep. And if you put, you can put two 18 350s in it and it's 3,600 lumens, which is shit, man. Pretty spectacular yeah, dang. In a little package. Turn it on and we'll all go outside and see if we can see it. Right. And it's got a really cool programming system. Uh, it's, it's a, it's a cool light that it's not just, a pretty face, but the insides are pretty amazing. Very nice. Cool. What do you got? I'm glad you asked. Uh, a 2003 <laughs> bullet knife. Um, one of those with the uh, Coca-Bola handles. The uh, Now, when you say bullet knife, what brand? Uh, the Remington bullet knife. Um, this oh, is the, cool. tra- yeah, the yeah, Trapper, yeah. which is the mini Trapper is one of my, my favorite little patterns from back in the day. Double bladed guy. Yep. Uh, when I was growing up, dude down the road had a little gun shop and uh, got this one from him. Very cool. Yeah, the Remington bullet knives are, they're beautiful. Yeah, I used to get one every every year for Christmas from my dad. I forgot to mention that one on our, our little podcast episode about That's me. pretty cool. Yeah, I love these things. No, you mentioned it. Oh, did I? Mm-hmm. There's going to be a, a point where I just forget what we've talked about altogether. Don't worry, I got you, man. I guess that point is today. <laughs> By the way, if I'm the dude who has to be your walking memory, <laughs> some you might want to go to a neurologist. Somebody better. <laughs> Not good. Sean, what are you carrying? Uh, I've got one of the Bad Blood Fire Spitter Flippers. I've been carrying it pretty religiously for the past few weeks. Nice. Is that and one of yours? Got a, yeah, I designed it. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah, man, very, very good knife for the price. You cannot complain about it. I mean, it's at an entry-level price point, and you get a hell of a lot of knife. Well, shit, can I change my answer to one of mine? Oh, uh, that's funny. And then I've got a Billy Cho fixed blade. I've been, I've actually been playing with it more this episode than the other. Very nice. Nice. Mark, what are you carrying? Uh, you know, last couple of days I've been carrying this, uh, I'll, I'll do Birch's, um, plug for him i've been carrying one of his an old swoop model flipper flat handled old school stuff and then during the episode i've actually been fiddling with this really cool little integral folder that uh a friend of ours made mr ken jordan oh cool so one of his nebulae integral folder yeah really fun little knife so i've been twiddling with that while we've been sitting here so kenny makes really neat stuff funny story he sent me a bunch to regrind in damascus and or those things were horrible. Like for some reason, when I would clean the blades at, before they were sharpened, they were still thin enough that they would cut me, and I sliced my thumb wide open probably three times. Uh, they were not any fun at all. Sounds like they were good cutters. Yeah, I, I didn't know where you're going with that one. Yeah, they they cut great. They cut great. That's because there wasn't much to hang on to, Tom. By the time it was all yeah, and I I ca- I would like try to clean the spine, and I would pinch the blade between my thumb and finger cleaning the spine and it would just yeah i didn't learn very quick it took me two or three cuts and then i was just like ah, these things are evil so for people that don't know about kenny's little teeny tiny integral it's an integral knife so it's all one piece of tie that's the handle it's got kind of like a little built-in lanyard loop thing and then it's closed length is like two and a half inches it's a tiny tiny little guy yeah the Blade's like one and a half or something like that. Right. And supposedly there's a couple out there with the uh, genuine Tom Crine regrind blood on them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> DNA samples in the wild. 
right? Mm -hmm. This is how Jurassic Park for knife makers will begin. That's exactly (laughs) it. Well, awesome episode, guys. I think that was good. Uh, well, yeah, we got our first heavy hitter down. Uh, that was fun. Now nah, you guys handled it like champs. <laughs> <laughs> I think, uh, yeah, good episode. Uh, hopefully folks enjoy it and maybe learned a little bit along the way or found some things to go, uh, heard about some things to go look at, some pictures, and uh, maybe do a little bit of their own research because we're so <laughs> Like uh, was said early in the episode, we're certainly not experts on this. And um, if Dr. Lucy wants to call and tell us that we got it all wrong, we're probably, that'd probably be a fair assessment. <laughs> <laughs> and and we, we probably should, the, the name of that book, um, for those out there that we, we did reference. Skagel, Handmade by Dr. James Lucy. And uh, there's a couple of those up on Amazon for $100. Get them while you can. Um, and then the other book is by Harry McAvoy and it's Skagel, the man and his knives. And if you're interested in that book, there are copies available from direct from Bob, Bobby Branton. Uh, he's got them priced very reasonably and he'll hook you up. He hooked us up. Oh, so Bobby actually is the distributor or has. Correct. Yeah. Interesting. Very cool. I don't know that. He, he, well, Bobby I think bought Harry McAvoy's business and that was the books ah, are part of that. Okay. So he does have copies, uh, new copies of the book. Just so you know, I went, I, I went ahead and went on eBay and bought all the knife books that I, I was missing because I know you guys are going to go buy them and they're going to be like $4,000. <laughs> <laughs> so I just got ahead of that curve. There you go. I think that about covers it. Uh, next show coming up is a uh, Florida show. You guys aren't going. I am going to go. So I'm looking forward to that. That'll be a fun time. Three weeks out. Go uh, get the heck out of Michigan. Get a little bit warm weather. So that'll be very welcome. I know my wife's looking forward to it big time. So do we know what we're doing next? Well, I didn't know last time, so I don't know this time. <laughs> You're not out of the loop this time, man. <laughs> there okay. ain't none of us know what's going on. If we want, we can either do questions for us or we can do the, you know, five knives everyone should know about or. Yeah. Dealer's choice. We also have some interviews kind of on deck. I think with the travel coming up, maybe we'll hold off on that till after, after I get back from Florida. But yeah, we have, we have a couple different things kind of in the wings. So surprise, uh, surprise episode seven, we'll announce it through the Facebook page. So definitely check that place out. Cause we hang out there a little bit and uh, talk about the show and we, we definitely want to do a, uh, at least a portion of a show where we take questions from folks. So we'll start a thread and folks can throw some, uh, some questions in there. Perfect. And then what are we doing with the book, Tom, with the giveaway? I, we, I just want to say thank you very much to all the people that left reviews and you know i know it was kind of a pain some people couldn't leave them through itunes they had to leave them on the facebook page for the show um, but we really appreciate everybody doing that that helps the show out with um, exposure and trying to find more listeners and stuff so yeah we're once this goes up we'll give it away and uh basically we'll find out who it's going to and uh i will autograph it uh put a little note in there for whoever wins it and send it on to uh michael And he can send it to Sean and then to you. Sounds good. Solid plan. Everybody will get a write a note in there. Yeah, really appreciate everyone out there, all your support and comments. Uh, You know, uh, this is a little bit nerve wracking sometimes. And uh, I guess at the end of the day, the fact that you guys appreciate what we're doing makes it all worthwhile. And if you've got an antidote about Skagel that we missed out on or know of or heard of, put it in the Facebook group. Yeah, please fill us in. If you know the mystery of the Chris logo, fill us in. Birch has been listening to too many podcasts, too many mystery podcasts. That's what this is coming down to. This is a, this is like my Oak Island right here. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thanks again for everybody for listening. Hope you found the episode interesting or enjoyable or ideally both. And um, we'll catch you next time. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Take care, folks.
To learn more about our makers, you can find Tom Crine on the web at crineknives.net, in his Facebook group, Crine Knives, or in his Instagram account, at Crine Knives. For Michael Birch, check birchtreeblades.com, Facebook group Birch Tree Blade Works, or Michael's Instagram at Birch Tree Blades. For myself and the Raygun Bead Project, we're on the web at raygundivision.com. We have a Facebook group called Raygun Division, or my personal Instagram at msteiner. For those interested in photos, references from the show, or some discussion about the show itself, you can find us on the web at markofthemaker.com, in a Facebook group called Mark of the Maker, or on our Instagram at Mark of the Maker. Last but not least, the ultra cool and haunting background music we use for the show is a piece called Noir Guitar by Stevie's Amp Shack, found at the Free Music Archive and licensed under Creative Commons CC BY 4.0. Thanks for listening. Mm-hmm.